Good evening. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Heather Reynolds, and I'm with Catholic Charities Fort Worth. And I would just, on behalf of all of us at Catholic Charities, like to welcome you here this evening. Um, i got to be honest, I'm really surprised because um, all of us at Catholic Charities uh, love to learn. We love to study this issue of poverty. But, you know, I had told our PR director, I was like, really, when we put out brain science, is anybody going to show? And um, I'm shocked that we packed the room. And so thank you um, for all of you who are just true blue advocates for those in poverty and who want to learn alongside with us and alongside our clients about what it's going to take to really end poverty one family at a time. You know, you know our theory of change at Catholic Charities Fort Worth, and our theory of change is really the way we believe in changing lives is through relationships, and those relationships are built with case management. Um, we believe really that case management is what's critical for a client's journey out of poverty. But I'll tell you, um, one of the questions we get asked the most is, you know, what really is case management? That word is, is super confusing. What do you really do, Catholic Charities, with the clients that you're serving? You know, we all probably really get the tactical things. Things like, you know, getting a client a job, getting a client a child care solution, a transportation solution. But what does case management look like that really changes lives? Why don't our clients, at the end of the day, just pull themselves up by their bootstraps? Why do they need us? Why do we relentlessly pursue the families that we serve? Tonight, you are in for a really special treat. Kimberly Lawrence, one of our own at Catholic Charities, is here to share with you about the work with our clients. Beyond the very surface level issues, most providers in our, in our space actually meet. Let me tell you a little bit about Kimberly. Kimberly is one of our case manager supervisors for the Padua pilot. She has worked in direct service with Padua for the whole time that we launched the pilot the last three and a half years. Before that, she served with us for four years in direct services with our Families First program, a program aimed at working with families to end uh, child abuse and the experiences of children going through that. She had previous jobs in child welfare, advancement, and volunteer management. She's a licensed social worker with a certification from UTA in treating people who have experienced trauma and abuse. She has an MSW uh, from UTA specializing with family and children. She has a BA in sociology and English from Trinity University. And beyond all of her amazing credentials, I would say all of us who have the privilege to work hand in hand with Kimberly feel like most importantly she is a teacher, that she has taught each and every one of us how to be better and how to do better. And I think you'll see very quickly why so many of the clients resonate so heavily with Kimberly. So join us in a journey at Catholic Charities tonight, a journey that I hope allows each of you in this room get a deeper sense of what case management is really all about. A journey that I hope she un helps you see why many others, government and other social service agencies, are not setting the same end goal of out of poverty as we're focused on at Catholic Charities. Join us on a journey tonight that helps you frame why this road with clients must be long, why this road must be purposeful, and that why this road must be backed with evidence. And join us on a journey tonight that helps you understand why we ask you to act as investors with us. Investors is case management to the solution in ending poverty in our community. So please join me in welcoming Kimberly to the stage. You made me blush. <laughs> well, good evening. I'm so happy to be here to talk about my favorite thing, brain science and social work. Um, so we're just going to go ahead and get started. So when clients come in to us for the first time, they're usually pretty unhappy. They're here because they need help, and they wouldn't be asking for help if they didn't have some serious problems. It's really hard to ask for help. And it's really frustrating to have to do it over and over again, like so many of our clients do, month in and month out, because your life can really begin to feel hopeless. There's a crisis, you panic, you scramble, you try to get help, eventually you get to take a breath and try again. 
But then there's another crisis, and there's more panic and scrambling and trying to get help from a different place because that place already helped you last time. And you take a breath and you try again. People in this cycle get tired and they get frustrated and they get angry. They get angry at themselves. They get angry at the endless effort at their life. They get angry that they feel stuck. So who do we work with? We work with people who want their lives to be different, but they usually aren't sure how to make that happen. And their anger and their frustration is making it even harder to get ahead. All right, so raise your hand if you set a New Year's resolution this year. Put them up. Okay, now leave them, everybody look around, hold them up high. Okay, now leave them up if you kept your New Year's resolution completely. I, I'm impressed. We have uh, three? Okay. Yeah, exactly. So I made a resolution two years ago about going to the gym. And I finally stopped paying for it this month <laughs> after never having stepped foot in the gym in two years. Change is hard, but let's look at my example. I wanted to be healthier. I wanted to lose weight, I wanted to feel better, I wanted to look better. That's all pretty important stuff. So I paid for the gym, I put it on my calendar, on revolving throughout the week, every week. I bought a new workout outfit, <laughs> the important stuff. But I still never made it happen. Even though I had the money to pay for it, I had the transportation to get there. I had my husband who could watch the kids. And I only work one job, so I should have had the time. And yet I never made it happen. Why not? All right, so here's the deal. People do things for one of three reasons. To avoid pain, to experience pleasure, or to connect to others. Let's try this out. Which of these applies to why I didn't make it to the gym? So instead of going to the gym, I just decided to spend more time connecting to my family um, and experiencing the pleasure of hanging out with them or with my friends. I also decided to avoid the pain of sore muscles and exercise. But that's all really short-term thinking, right? Because if I was focused on the long term, I would have said, well, exercise would actually probably make me avoid the pain of chronic disease. I would um, definitely get to experience that pleasure of a dopamine high. If you're a long distance runner, you know, if you make it past three miles, then everything from there, you start feeling better and better. Um, and I probably would have made some new friends at the gym or, you know, at least my friends who exercise wouldn't have been embarrassed, you know, to talk about their workouts knowing I would pass out in the first five seconds. So I was not thinking long term on this one. Instead, I finally gave up and I replaced the gym appointment on my calendar with Espanol and Vino. And I wear my yoga pants to drink wine and practice my Spanish with my friends on my porch. So, if I'm not always thinking long term, despite the fact that I have a bachelor's degree, I have a master's degree, I have a clinical license, and this is what I do for a living, is help people to make change, it's less surprising that our clients have trouble making change happen. They may have the desire, but they often lack the resources and the ability. So that's to do with the brain. When I'm hiring a new case manager, what I'm looking for is respectful curiosity because when they meet a new client and the client is rude or lies to them or doesn't follow through on the action steps they set or just doesn't even show up for the appointment, I don't want the case manager to think, ah, this client, they just really don't want to change. Because what brain science tells us is that all misbehavior points to an unmet need. So a great case manager knows that anger and not showing up is really just the brain in fight or flight. They know that the client's behavior is keeping, them, is keeping others at a distance so they can hide their vulnerability. Their behavior is saying that they need something that they're not getting. 
And that's a place to start. So respectful curiosity means wanting to learn what is leading to the behavior that we can see. Respectful curiosity requires believing that the client is worthy of having their needs met. Respectful curiosity leads to helping the client to believe that they're worthy. And respectful curiosity helps to calm the fear so they can get there. All right, my favorite thing. Oh, that didn't come up, I'm sorry. All right, I'll give you all a second with that. My favorite thing, brain science. Let's talk brain development. The brain develops from the bottom up. So at birth, the brain stem and the midbrain are ready to go. Um, they're the autopilot that keep your heart beating, they keep your temperature regulated, they keep you breathing. It keeps you alive. It just does its thing in the background and it's ready to go as soon as you're born. The limbic system is your feelings brain. That develops next because it exists at birth, but it's completely unregulated. Now, our cortex or our thinking brain is the last to develop. So that, um, that develops through our experiences that trigger connections because learning is actually the process of making connections in your brain. Most of this growth doesn't actually begin until later on in childhood and adolescence and isn't finished until, does anybody know? How long does it take for your brain to actually finish developing? Almost 30 years old, right. Some of you sitting in this crowd may not even be quite 30 years old. <laughs> so stop and remember the decisions you made when you were 20. Were they well thought out? Mine were not. And that's normal. Because we have to build a connection and then we have to do it again and again to build those skills and the judgment ability to start to think abstractly. And we have to learn to access our working memory so that we can learn from what happened last time when we did great and we want to do that again or we definitely don't want that to happen again so we need to go in a different way. So those successes and setbacks are what help us to learn as we do it over and over again. One thing that almost all of our clients have in common is trauma. So if mom or dad was never around when they were a kid because they were off scoring drugs or on the flip side, because they worked three jobs to keep a roof over everyone's head, that kiddo never had someone to teach them how to regulate their emotions. So many of our clients have actually lived in survival mode or in fight or flight for their entire lives. So contrary to typical development starting from the ground up, we have a lot of clients um, who never are, have the opportunity to have emotion regulation support their interpersonal skills growth and finally their planning ability. So um, when the light, if the brain switches into survival gear, what happens is actually the lights go out in the cortex and there's very little capacity left to focus on um, cognition and really more than just what's going on right now in the moment. So it's not just that our clients don't know how to regulate their emotions and don't have people skills, they also never got the chance to develop the skills and abilities that it takes to create plans and to problem solve and to follow through. So even if our clients come to us wanting to make a change, they often don't have the skills necessary to do so because they're stuck in that limbic fight or flight. So is it too late? Absolutely not. Fortunately, the brain can continue to grow and develop throughout life, um, given plasticity. However, the expression, you can't teach an old dog a new trick, it rings true because it is very difficult the older we get, but definitely not impossible. We learn by doing. So when you do something over and over again, it becomes a habit and it's easy to just default to it. The reason for that is that your brain has created a connection that grew stronger and stronger each time you did that. For example, the first time you tried to ride a bike, you probably did not succeed. And the second time that you got on, even though now you knew what to do and you had tried it before, you probably still fell off. But every time you got back on, you got a little bit better and eventually you were able to stay on and to ride. 
That's because each time you tried, your brain made that connection stronger and smoother, and eventually it became known. And then you didn't even have to think about it anymore. So back to why our clients believe, behave the way they do, even though it doesn't help them get where they want to be when they no-show and they yell and they argue and they fight. What helps you survive in one world doesn't necessarily translate to another. If lying about what you did today keeps your husband from beating you, that same survival strategy of lying doesn't keep your boss from firing you when you're late. Neurons that fire together wire together. So if the brain created a connection between lying and avoiding danger, then that connection cannot be undone. Instead, the brain will have to build a new connection that it is indeed possible to avoid danger without lying. And the first time you experience this, it's just a tiny little footpath in the grass compared to the inner state that you already have formed with lying. And only with repeated use will this change from a path to a gravel road and then a paved road and eventually an overpass to go over the previous connection. So, number one, this is a whole new paradigm to realize that what worked before doesn't work now. And then to figure out what does work, that's a lot of learning and that can take years. So, what do we do to help all this learning happen? What is case management? We start with ourselves. We work with respectful curiosity. And so rather than saying that our clients are rude or resistant or unengaged, we follow our Catholic social teaching. We believe in the dignity and the worth of all people. And so we evoke from the client the context of their behavior. We want to learn about their thoughts and their feelings so that we get a picture of what's going on. But this isn't so that we can draw our own picture of the situation, because learning about the client is not for us. Learning about the client is for the client. It's for the client to see where they are and then compare that to where they want to be. It is an intentional time to give them permission to dream when their whole life has probably been spent hearing they aren't worthy to think about a future. And those voices from outside have slowly become the voice they hear inside. Our work is for the client to develop their own voice, to talk themselves into change, and to remind themselves why they're worthy of the best life they can lead. Our partnership is a profound respect for the client. We are a privileged witness to change. We hold the space for our clients to stop running, to stop fighting, and to start growing. We do this through a three-part approach, building safety, empowering action, and respecting the process. And each of those is built around science, partnership, and being able to see the bigger picture. But how do we help clients move past fight or flight so they do collaborate and they do show up to do the work that it's gonna take to get to their bigger, brighter future? Scarf, okay, more brain science. These are the things that determine whether our feeling brain panics and sends us into fight or flight, or relaxes and opens the doorway to our thinking brain to begin working toward our goals. So whether or not the client feels safe in our partnership has a huge impact on how successful they can be. So what do these things mean? So status is all about feeling valued. So we respect each client's dignity and worth. Certainty is about knowing what to expect. So we use the same approach in every meeting and we work transparently and we follow through by doing what we say we'll do. Autonomy is all about having a sense of control and with trauma, that's one of the biggest things that's been taken away. So we do not make the decisions, the client does. The client tells us where we're going, what their bigger, brighter future looks like, and then they set the action steps to get there. Relatedness is a sense of safety with others and really a sense of belonging. So we tell our clients this is a partnership and we let them know that we are here for as long as it takes and we won't judge them and we will make sure that we all stay on the same page. 
And finally, fairness is a perception of being treated fairly. So we make sure that clients understand that this is the way the program works for everyone. When you stay, you show up, you're safe, you create a brand new pathway in that client's brain for what relationships can look like. And then when the client feels safe, their thinking brain will activate and they can begin to develop the skills needed to be successful in working toward financial freedom. So what does it take to achieve success? For clients who have never felt worthy of dreaming, the safety that they've built in our partnership through SCARF means they can finally see more for their life. Their perception broadens and it begins to feel like maybe there are other options than what they've yet experienced. So setting a goal begins to not feel so pointless anymore. And setting steps to achieve that goal, well, that's going to require cognition and working memory, going back to what's worked in the past or what we, how we need to re-navigate, um, and the creativity to take what worked in one situation and synthesize it into a new context, or to think through why what worked before might not apply here and find new solutions. So instead of lying to the boss about being late to avoid being fired, thinking through what caused them to be late, making a plan to not do so again, and then presenting that plan to the boss to indicate their integrity, their commitment, and their proactivity. And that takes a lot. And when things fall apart, because they will sometimes, because life happens, recalculating those steps and building and leaning into the collaboration that it takes to, mil to build and maintain the support that it will take for them to achieve success. When a client has done all of this work, our role is to live out our values, to show respect for what has been accomplished and how difficult it was to do so, to show respect for the success, but also to show respect for the struggle, to celebrate the wins and to sit with the client during the setbacks, to help the client hold their candle of hope when it feels absolutely overwhelming. Because the more progress the client makes, the more responsibility they take on and the more they have to manage, the more they have to lose. And that is a lot to hold, especially when those around them who used to feel they were equals often now look down at our clients for moving on and moving up and leaving them behind. This journey is long and it shouldn't be lonely, but it is. And we are there to help them acclimate and reorder and rebuild. And all of that deserves respect. So what does success look like? The first time we met Mr. M, he told us he had just gotten out of prison for the sixth time, and he wanted to stay out this time. He said he had been clean for one month, and he was tired of running and drugging. He said it wasn't right by his faith. He had just gotten the second job he'd ever worked in his life. It was the week before his 48th birthday. He had heart problems and joint problems and blood pressure issues from a life of drugs and living on the street. Oh, and he was missing an eye because it got impaled by a branch when he was running through the woods to get away from the cops running from the trap house. You learn new vocabulary when you're a social worker. It's a drug house. Uh, he had very little, very poor education and multiple felonies on his record, and he was homeless. I honestly had no idea where to even begin, but we did. And he got housed, employed, he got a bank account for the first time in his life with money in a savings account. He got back into recovery support and stayed clean, and he went into trauma therapy. He earned a culinary certification and developed new skills and abilities. Our work wasn't problem solving as much as it was strengths evoking. And I needed to know everything that looked like such a barrier on paper was just an outcome of unresolved trauma. I learned more than he did in that time. Let's talk about Ms. O. The other day she called me to follow up with a savings plan we'd put together and several minutes into the conversation, she paused to say something to someone that was with her and it turns out she'd just been in a car wreck like minutes before she called me. 
She'd never mentioned it. She was calm and collected and focused on following up with me about her progress and saving for her house. This is a woman who, when I met her three years ago, was so stuck in her limbic system that she cried every time I saw her and all but a couple hairs on her head had fallen out from the stress. Now, she was completely nonplussed by a fender bender, calling me from the scene of the accident. She told me, it's no problem. She's got insurance, no one was hurt, I'll get a rental car. She has come so far that she didn't even remember that two years ago she got in a car accident and her credit was so bad that she didn't even have a credit card and didn't have enough money to use a debit card to rent a car and she couldn't have paid for the cost anyway. And she didn't even think of that. It's no problem, I'll get a rental car. Because after counseling and connecting and calming, now she's done the work to improve her credit, to increase her income, she's opening her own business, and she's about to be a homeowner. And when life happens, she rolls with the punches and has the internal and the tangible resources to continue and to stay focused. I put more money in my bank account, I'm almost ready to buy my house. Hold on, let me deal with the police for just a second on this car wreck. This is three years into the program, and she's getting really close to the finish line. Finally, when we met Miss N, she was living in a homeless shelter with two of her four children. She didn't have a diploma, a job, or a home. She owed $18,000 in back child support, and her abusive ex had the title to the car that she was using and held on to it to control her. She was so angry at the world, and regardless of her financial situation, you remember this is an out of poverty program, all she wanted to work on was getting her two older children back in her home, in a home of hers. So, she's in charge. For a year, we followed her lead, we worked single-mindedly toward reuniting her family and getting them housed, and then that day came, just in time for Thanksgiving and she celebrated Thanksgiving dinner with all of her children at her dinner table in her home. And then the next week, when I went out into the lobby to greet her for our next session, I walked right past her. I didn't even see her because I barely could recognize her when she stood up and got my attention. I couldn't believe she was the same person that I had worked with for a year who had argued and fought and screamed and cried and just been angry every time I saw her. The woman before me, she was calm. She was collected, she was focused, she was at peace. She immediately said, I gotta start on my GED, right? December, it's the next semester, it's the last semester, my daughter's graduating, I have to get my GED before she gets her diploma because I'm the mom. I have to set the example, right? We went, well, that's a couple of months, and you, you made it through fourth grade? Whew, we got some work to do. Okay. She said, I will do it. And we said, you will do it. And she did it. She got her GED before her daughter graduated that May, so we, they had a celebration party for her, and then they had a celebration party for her daughter, who followed suit. Um, and when she did that, just like she had planned, she told us her confidence was so increased that she was no longer willing to just stay comfortable. She said she had been so sure when she told us that she was going to do it, that she was going to fail, and that that would eat yet another piece of herself away. But she did it anyway, because everyone told her, okay, you're going to do this. And she didn't know exactly why, but she listened and she said, okay, I'm going to do this. And she said she was so scared, but she did it. So now she has no choice. She said, I have to keep going. But one thing stuck with me the most. She said, I thought back about all the people who kept me online when I kept going offline in the wrong direction. As many times as I messed up, People kept giving me chances. Growing is a process, and it's hard, and it's messy, 
and it is not linear. This is what success can look like. When each period of progress is longer than the last, and each time there's a setback, the client leans in and learns from it instead of running away. And we stick with them. We stay through the success and through the struggle. So what does success look like? It's holistic, it's strengths-based, it's client-led. It is not a quick fix. It is not judgmental. It is highly trained staff with respectful curiosity, partnering with people who really want to change their lives. It's people beginning to feel safe and getting unstuck and beginning to form new neural pathways. It's people beginning to believe they are worthy of living their best life and stopping fighting, stopping running, and moving forward one intentional step at a time. That was just awesome, in my opinion. So, Kimberly, thank you. So, we are going to take questions from you all. Um, we ask that we have Allie and Alma, I believe, with mics coming around. We do ask that uh, you speak into a mic because we're recording tonight, so we want to record the questions um, as well. Um, but I'll start while you guys raise your hands and Allie and um, Alma come over to you. Um, why do you do this every day? <laughs> I don't know what else I would do at this point. Um, I, I was telling somebody a, a minute ago that um, they said this job must be a, a new surprise every day. And I said the trick to this job is never being surprised. Because while I probably have seen and heard it all, I try to never be surprised by it because that's me putting myself into it. And the truth is, I really take that privileged witness piece very seriously. So my role is to be there and to, in so many ways, be a mirror, be, a, somebody called me a diary once. I keep track of what they say and I feed it back to them at important moments. Um, I just get to sit and watch People learn things about themselves that, that they hadn't ever realized, that they hadn't known they were capable of. Um, I get to see people, I get to see their lives change. I'm, there's just, there's nothing more amazing than that. And it does take a really long time and you get to know people really well. Um, I'm not really a small talk person. I wanna just dive in um, and hear it all and learn it all. Um, and so I just, I'm constantly in awe that people are willing to be that vulnerable and open themselves up to share that journey. Um, and so I can't imagine anything that that would be more spectacular to do. Awesome. Thank you. Questions? Yes, John. Uh, multi part question. Uh, how many caseworkers do you have on staff? Uh, what is their average caseload, uh, client load? Uh, do you have positions open that are unfunded? Um, and what's your dream? <laughs> Shyla, you answer you the first part of that? You can answer for Padua that? if you'd okay. like to. Yeah. So I work with Padua, the Padua pilot, um, and then we also have our case management services as well. So for Padua, um, we actually work in teams of two. So every client works with a case manager and a case worker. Um, should talk a little bit mm -hmm. about what that looks like. Okay. Our case managers are um, all master's level. Um, many have clinical licensure. Um, and they really work with the client. I love, Remington always says, the case managers work with the inside um, and the case workers work with the outside. So every client has their case manager to sit with them and to do a lot of the evoking and the bringing forward from the client, what is their motivation, what is their hope, what is their dream, and helping to make a plan. The case workers walk with the client on the journey to make that happen. 
Um, and so all of them are at least bachelor's level with backgrounds in um, social work. And a lot of times when you think of case management in other agencies, it's that. It's the connecting, it's the resourcing, the brokering, the going out. But we never hand somebody a phone number and say, here you go, good luck, right? Our caseworkers go on that journey with them because every step of the way is that process of creating those new um, neural connections, right? So, for example, um, one time um, I, my partner and I went with the client to JPS. And I'm not answering your question, but I get off on a tangent, but quickly. Um, we'll get there. We'll so land there. We will. Um, so we went to JPS and um, incredible organization, one of our partners, and we went in to get them connected so they could get access to health care. Um, and so they needed to have documents. And of course, you know, um, my partner had provided the list of them so that she could get them ready and be ready to go. Well, one of them was missing. And she said, oh, well, we'll have to go home and I'll have to try some other time. And so our caseworker said, well, actually, you know what? Remember, you had me take a picture of that. And so I have that here on my tablet. I can just pull it up and I can email it to them and they can print it out. Oh, OK, great. All right, let's go. So in we go. Um, so then the, they ran into some other situation and there was some other little hiccup. And they said, oh, it's over. Forget it. I just can't do it. Um, and the caseworker said, well, you know, let's talk through this. And they kind of problem solved and figured out how to make that happen. And they were still able to get um, to, to be able to get services that day. Um, that is executive function building. Mm -hmm. So that is when we talk about that it's, that, it's all or nothing. It's that black and white thinking. If there's one piece missing or if anything goes wrong, it's all over. So while the case manager does a lot of the work in building, um, uh, building up that hope, evoking that motivation, really getting them to be able to see where they're headed and make that plan, the case worker is helping them to carry that out and build the skills that it takes to persist to see through, to problem solve. Um, so in Padua, anyway, um, that's the way that our teams work. And right now we have, um, well, right now we have four team partner teams and then we have a triad um, of a three-person team because we also are trying out um, case workers being trained um, to uh, work as case managers. Um, and then agency-wide, we are at about uh, 60 case managers throughout our organization. Padua is an example of one thing, and, and the distinqui distinguishing factor about Padua, when we launched this three and a half years ago, we wanted to actually do a randomized control trial alongside Padua, so we could know, does what Kimberly, does the way Kimberly's talking about serving clients matter? Does it really make a difference? And the great thing we've been able to see is, especially compared to a control group, we are seeing profound effects with clients that we're serving. Uh, we also have general case management. We have case management going on in the context of the employer setting um, to work with uh, the working poor that are showing up to work every day. And then uh, one of our biggest initiatives is called Stay the Course. It's all about community college um, uh, persistence and completion. It's a partnership we have with Tarrant County Community College because we believe that is the vehicle to get people um, to success is to case manage them through community college education where they can get on the other side of that and get into middle skill jobs and so you know our to your question about growth I'd say we have two things that limit our growth one is both with stay the course and Padua we have experiments running and so we're still trying to crack the code on the the right formula and dosage of services to um, achieve out of poverty work with our clients. So continued research and more time, and then the other aspect is, is funding for expansion. Hi, I'm, I'm Steve Landon. Hi, Steve. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I drive for Catholic Charities, and every week I see 10 to 12 people. Uh, if I think one of them might need this program, what, what should I be looking for? Because I see these 10, 10 to 12 clients and they're, they're from all stages of life. And uh, what should I be looking for that maybe I could help you all if I see somebody? And, and I've done that before. Uh, yeah. since, so what, what do I need to be looking for? Yeah, one of the things we're always looking for is change talk. A what? So, change talk. Okay. So change talk is any indication that you want something to be different. Um, and we all know that we say we want, want to change lots of things, right? It's a process. 
Um, it's one of the backbones of our case management model is understanding what stage of change clients are in. Um, most of our clients, if they're coming directly to us already, they've already decided, okay, I'm thinking about change. I'm pretty certain about it. I, you said that this may take five years. I better be pretty certain about it. Um, but it starts with one little kernel, right? And then it grows. And so anytime somebody says, oh, I wish I had a better job or gosh, I wish I got paid more for the long hours that I work or um, you know, anything that indicates they're thinking about doing something differently. Um, the great thing about Catholic Charities is we have lots of different levels of services and lots of different programs. So we may have something that piques their interest and even if they're not ready to change now, just letting them know that these programs are available so that when they are ready, we're here. Okay, um, who, do, who do I need to talk, talk to? Mm -hmm. We can get you information on that. Right. So Thank we have you. someone who handles, you know, the outreach for us as an organization and specifically if it's where there's a randomization component involved knows how to handle that. And so okay. we can get you information on that. All right. Thank Great. you very much. We love that question. Thank Thanks. you for driving for us. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Charlie Powell. Uh oh, I'm in trouble. Kimberly, thank you for what you did every day. I, I had two questions. We hit upon it. How many people, we talk about how many is in the system, how many do you have waiting to get in the system with the continued growth? And I'll say this, it wasn't my intent, but Kimberly mentioned, as you, many of you know, I chair the board at John Peter Smith Hospital. So I'm glad the example you used, we did take care of oh. that. <laughs> I, I, I didn't know you were gonna use that example, but Robert Irwin and his staff do a phenomenal job at JPS. But we have a tremendous partnership with Catholic Charities. And I get emotional every time, because you know, you're addressing, we see a tremendous population over a million uh, instances a year with JPS and our 52 clinics. And it takes the entire, I'd say this even as a hospital system with our behavioral sciences, we can't get into the changing of life mm -hmm. that Catholic Charities does. But I can tell you that with my years at JPS, I have to tell you the only way to deal with it is the entire, the education, the, the, the getting the self-confidence and so, the method in which you're doing is the way to solve it. Because sometimes, whether it's mental health, whether it's MHMR, and I'm not gonna speak for the organizations, I've certainly been involved with them, but the reality is there's a revolving doors and this program truly works. So thank y'all for what you're doing. So you are so speaking my language in terms of holistic approach um, and our partnership with you has been such a blessing um, because our approach to working with clients is to start um, from the bottom up. Um, our model is begins with well-being because we know that, um, okay, so we're a out of poverty program. You'd think, okay, let's get you a job and you know, let's get you focused on financial coaching. None of those skills and abilities are there if you're sick and you're missing work and you lose your job because you have a chronic disease and or, and or a mental health issue. And so that's where we start. Um, and in Padua, I know last year over 50% of our clients had, a, uh, had somebody in their family, because we work with the family, not a person, with um, a diagnosed mental health um, illness. And that's just what was diagnosed. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, we start there working with mental health, working with physical health, um, as well as with relationship health, those skills. Um, and so we know that the rest of the work is only going to come when there's a shift in their belief systems as well as their physical and mental ability to do that work then to set up the supports and the connections that it's going to take to be able to sustain the education and career readiness training that it takes to earn the money to move into financial freedom. So yes, that partnership is such a blessing. And you are absolutely working in this field because our clients are your clients and your mm -hmm. clients are our clients. I have a question back here. Um, I, I heard that you um, said that you work with parents. How does that look as far as how many children you help? Because a lot of times we know that, the, that parents that experience trauma, they transfer it on to their children. So how does your caseload manage all of that extra? Yes. Um, so we have a named client and then we have their eight children or their five children or their four children. Um, 
So most of our clients, uh, I'm going to speak for Padua, most mm -hmm. of our clients are um, single mothers with um, numerous children. Um, so I said my client is the family, not the person, right? Um, even when we were planning Padua, such a big part of it was understanding the importance of um, that generational component with poverty, with trauma, um, which poverty is trauma through um, the outcomes of the um, scarcity mm -hmm. um, and living through that. Um, in addition to kind of everything else that can go with it. So um, we are always working with um, the parents, with the children, with the whole family household to look at that. Um, so not only are we working on um, mom and her dad getting career readiness and education and moving up so that they can earn more money, um, but there are lines in our kind of holistic assessment and um, service planning that are directly about working with the children. Um, a huge component of what we do is um, advocating and educating about 504s, about IEPs, helping parents to understand um, what, that their kiddo is going through a lot of stress, there's been a lot of instability, um, maybe there, we want to look more and see is there um, an underlying mental health disorder or dyslexia, learning difference, all of these kinds of things so that we can get them started with a better education earlier. Because if there's one thing we hear over and over again with our clients is they dropped out of school in junior high, they dropped out of school in elementary school because they were so far behind because they just got looked over because they changed schools, because there was so much going on, because there was so much chaos, and learning just wasn't a priority. And sometimes that was about it not being a priority in the home, but a lot of times it was just about instability and that, them not being able to keep up. So stability is always a priority for our kiddos. Um, so making sure that they have their mental health, their physical health checkups, that they have any mental health needs, that they have any assessment um, that they need for school, that they're doing well there. Um, so our case managers are not only um, advocating for our clients, but a lot of times working with school counselors and principals and daycares um, and all of those pieces so that um, these kiddos um, are much further along on their way, um, so they're not going to need our program. And their parents are so excited about that. Because I will, one other comment on that is that I said our base, right, is that we want to work with the clients to um, uh, work on, you know, them developing stronger self-esteem and self-confidence and working on their health, but I haven't I haven't met a mother yet who didn't say, that can wait, I need to focus on my kids' needs, mm -hmm. right? And so I always have to say, right, you got to put your oxygen mask on first. Mm -hmm. You got to be strong for this journey. It's a long journey, right? And your kids need you. So we need to make you healthy, we need to make you strong so that you can do everything it's going to take to take care of those kiddos and give them everything that you want them to have. Awesome. I think we have time for one more question. Yes. Hi, Ann Jindal. Um, sorry. I'm a high school teacher, and so kind of along the lines with the other question, um, I'm not a, obviously a trained counselor, and I know I leave the work to the counselors on campus, and other than following 504s and IEPs and things like that, what can I do? Because many of the students I teach, and I teach at high school in Fort Worth ISD, so many of them are exactly probably the clients that you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. Obviously, I can't get to the parent directly as you would, but is there something I can do as a teacher? Yes. Awesome. I'd love to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> so first and foremost, let them know you are a safe person. You are there. They can talk to you. They can share with you. Um, because they go to your class day in and day out. They form a relationship with you. You get to know them. They get to know you. Schools are safe places for our children. If they're hungry at home, if they're scared at home, if everything is always different at home, they never know what to expect, school is always the same. You create safety and structure in their lives, and for that, that's everything, okay? So go one step further and say, I'm a safe place. Anybody who ever needs to talk to me, anybody who ever needs to just, you know, um, you know have someone to listen, I'll be that ear. And second of all, then know that you can refer to us, right? You, in Fort Worth ISD, you can refer through the Family Resource Centers, um, and you can um, send them our way, and through you know, any number of our programs, we can support that family and that kiddo. But thank you for the work you do, because you don't realize how much you're already doing by just being there and giving them that calm day in and day out. Yeah.
Well, as we wrap up tonight, um, I think all of you would agree to join me in thanking Kimberly for not oh, oh. And that's not only for her excellent presentation this evening, but for the fact that, um, and it's not even for what she does every day with the clients we serve and the staff she teaches, but I really believe that, you know, Kimberly's leadership at our agency is really going to change the face of, way, of the way case management is done throughout our country. And so we have a huge debt of gratitude for Kimberly's focus and her commitment and her drive and desire to be this privileged witness. Sorry, okay, I'm done. To be this privileged witness to those um, that we have the privilege to serve. So um, just to wrap up this evening, thank you for coming out. Thank you for taking Thank time um, to learn more about the work that we do. We could not be more um, grateful for each and every one of you. In typical Catholic Charities Fort Worth style, um, since you are here this evening, you will be getting a follow-up call from one of our team members. We ask that you do one simple thing, which is answer the phone. Um, and so, um, and, and please be honest and share your feedback that you have um, about tonight's event. We get better because you help make us better. Um, and then the last request for you is one of the most important things you can continue to do to help advance our mission is introduce us to one other person in your life who you think would like to learn about this work. So also when you take that follow-up call, um, be thinking about someone you could help introduce and bring into the Catholic Charities fold because that's the way we continue to grow and expand our services. So thank you for joining us this evening and one more round of applause for the amazing panel. Okay, now I'm done. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>